So if you recall anything about last week when we were gathered here, we were in the previous two chapters of this book, and uh, I just want to say a mess, uh, just a brief comment about last week. There was a lot more encouragement in that, uh, all that we talked about last Sunday, chapters 9 and 10, there was a lot more encouragement. In fact, we ended by reading the six verses in Psalm 23, which are always so comforting. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know, that that whole idea, uh, it's kind of been a, uh, a recurring theme here the last few weeks about Jesus being our shepherd. And He's good. Even in the Scripture I read from John 10 at the beginning of the gathering this morning. So when you think about that and the encouragement and Jesus being our shepherd, I need to prepare you for today because chapter 11 is not like that. In fact, it's almost... I don't know if there could be a more stark contrast between last week in chapters 9 and 10, and then today, chapter 11. In fact, uh, James Boyce, who's a, a great, great pastor, preacher, commentator, he's no longer with us, he's, he's in heaven, but in his commenting on this chapter, he called this chapter of Zechariah one of the darkest prophecies in the entire body of Israel's prophetic literature. It's a pretty big statement. Talking about all the prophets. And he's talking about this one chapter that he's saying it's one of the darkest. So, and I, I'm sitting here preparing for this and reading through this and studying. I thought, okay, um, how am I supposed to encourage people, you know, and point people to Jesus when I'm, I'm reading what somebody called the darkest chapter in the whole prophecy about God's people? And so, um, you can imagine my... My difficulty. But here's what I found. Darkness may last for a night. But joy comes in the morning. Sometimes we need challenges and, and difficulties and problems. Heartache struggle if we're going to truly appreciate the goodness of God we just sang about his goodness we sang about his amazing grace the choir sang about how wonderful the Lord is well if we don't have any kind of comparison to make if we can't uh, know what it's like to struggle, to have loss, to have challenge and difficulty. If we can't know those things in the darkness, how will we ever truly appreciate what God has done, who He is? How can we really get a, a good comparison, a good reference point? So I believe this, this chapter in Zechariah's prophecy has a very specific goal for us. We have to know the agony of defeat before we can appreciate the thrill of victory. So I want to read chapter 11 for us today, 17 verses, and then talk about a, a couple of things here that I believe will point us in the right direction, ultimately point us to Jesus. Here's what the Bible says, Zechariah chapter 11, verse 1. Open your doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour your cedars. Wail, O Cyprus, for the cedar has fallen, for the glorious trees are ruined. Wail, oaks of Bashan, for the thick forest has been felled. The sound of the wail of the shepherds, for their glory is ruined. The sound of the roar of the lions, for the thicket of the Jordan is ruined. Thus says the Lord my God, become shepherd of the flock doomed to slaughter. Those who buy them slaughter them and go unpunished. And those who sell them say, Blessed be the Lord, I have become rich. And their own shepherds have no pity on them. For I will no longer have pity on the inhabitants of this land. 
declares the Lord. Behold, I will cause each of them to fall into the hand of his neighbor and each into the hand of his king. And they shall crush the land and I will deliver none from their hand. So I became the shepherd of the flock doomed to be slaughtered by the sheep traders. And I took two staffs, one I named Favor, the other I named Union, and I tended the sheep. In one month, I destroyed the three shepherds, but I became impatient with them, and they also detested me. So I said, I will not be your shepherd. What is to die, let it die. What is to be destroyed, let it be destroyed. And let those who are left devour the flesh of one another. And I took my staff favor and I broke it, annulling the covenant that I had made with all the people's. So it was annulled on that day, and the sheep traders who were watching me knew that it was the word of the Lord. Then I said to them, if it seems good to you, give me my wages, but if not, keep them. And they weighed out as my wages 30 pieces of silver. Are y'all listening? Then the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the lordly price at which I was priced by them. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. Then I broke my second staff, Union, annulling the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. Then the Lord said to me, Take once more the equipment of a foolish shepherd. For behold, I'm raising up in the land a shepherd who does not care for those being destroyed, or seek the young, or heal the maimed, or nourish the healthy but devours the flesh of the fat ones, tearing off even their hooves. Woe to my worthless shepherd who deserts the flock. May the sword strike his arm and his right eye. Let his arm be wholly withered, his right eye utterly blinded. Father, in Jesus' name I pray, speak to our hearts. Speak clearly and help us understand. For Christ's sake, amen. So I know what happens sometimes when we read through these minor prophets. and A lot of times in the Old Testament, man, we'll read some scripture and we'll get to the end and we'll, we'll have this thought. We might not say it out loud, but here's what we're thinking. What in the world did I just hear? What does that mean? And I get it. I'm not insensitive to that. So as we walk through it, I hope there will be some clarity that the Lord will give us as we talk about this. There's three sections in this chapter. The first three verses, then a big section in the middle from verse 4 down to verse 14, and then the last three verses, 15 to 17. The kind of bookends of judgment, if you will. So that's kind of uh, the the challenge that I spoke of as... as uh, As we started, this is a dark chapter, but it has a purpose. The first thing that we'll see in our scripture today is judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. You read the first three verses and it's just terrible. (laughs) I mean, let's just be honest. Uh, Open the door so fire will devour your seers. Okay, so everything's getting burned up. Talks about... The cedar having fallen, the glorious trees being ruined, the thick forest having been felled. Then you hear these sounds. The shepherds are wailing. They're, they're, they're crying, sobbing. That's because their glory is ruined. And then you hear the, the, even the animals, the lions, are, are roaring because this thicket of Jordan is ruined. So what I want you to see real clearly is that this first portion of chapter 11 is actually looking forward to something that's going to happen. You know, that's what prophets do, right? They, they tell us about things that are going to happen. So this is looking forward to after the Messiah has come and gone. He's, he's come, Jesus comes to the earth, lives a sinless life, dies a sinner's death, rises victoriously on the third day, ascends back into heaven, commissions the New Testament church through powerful preaching, through the falling of the Holy Spirit. Everything is going according to plan. Then about the year 66 A.D., the Roman armies storm into Jerusalem. 
and Jerusalem is destroyed. From A.D. 66 to A.D. 70, judgment that was mentioned 500 years before Jesus was born, and here it comes. A lot of the things that are talked about here by Zechariah are messianic in nature. In other words, they're talking about Jesus and what happens when Jesus shows up physically, bodily on the scene. And, and all this um, odd, maybe symbolic sounding talk, all this stuff that we read in these prophets, sometimes it's hard to understand. But the more we read, the more we study, the more we research and dig in, then we start to see we, we need to pay attention to what's happening here. Because what's better than learning from your own mistakes? Learning from somebody else's mistakes, <laughs> right? Right? You, you don't want to have to step in the pothole yourself. You want to watch somebody else and say, oh, they did that, this happened, all right, I don't want to do that. Right? That, that's how you grow. That's how you mature in life. You learn from somebody else's mistakes. And you incorporate that. Well, here it is. What are we going to learn? Judgment is coming. So here's our application. I'm going to try to give a little bit of application with each section here. The application for us in this first opening paragraph is this. The reason for the judgment that's coming is the rejection of God's Messiah. You want to know why the capital of the Jewish state in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Roman armies? By and large, how did the Jews uh, react to Jesus? Rejection. God sent... You know why Jesus said in John 1, I came into my own, and my own received me not. But to all those who did receive me, I gave them the power to become children of God. So, the rejection of the Messiah is the reason for the judgment. So, so what do we do with that? We incorporate that into our day, our time, our lives. This is true for us, because as we're going to see in this next paragraph, the main section of chapter 11, rejecting Christ and His gospel has severe, unavoidable consequences. We will be held accountable for how we respond to Jesus. Plain and simple. That's our application. The gospel requires a response. Number two, actions have consequences. As I just alluded to, actions have consequences. Verse 4 down to verse 14. This is the major section of this chapter, and it's going to tell us some things about what Zechariah was asked to do or called to do, commanded to do, in his relationship with the people to whom he was preaching. So the first three verses describe Zechariah's assignment. So from verse 4, 5, and 6, Zechariah is told to become a shepherd to God's people as a foreshadowing of Christ coming as the Messiah. So there's another prophet who had something similar happen to him. If you remember Hosea, Hosea was asked to marry a woman of harlotry for the purpose of uh, identifying with how God's people were cheating on God. For, you know, that, so he, he had to personally experience some things to be able to really embody the message he was preaching. So now Zechariah is sitting here and he's told, verse 4, thus says the Lord my God. Well, when you read that, we better pay real close attention to what comes next, right? When God's speaking, thus says the Lord. Okay, so what, what did he say? Become the shepherd. Become the shepherd to God's people. He was to serve and then be rejected and then abandon them to the consequences of that rejection. Now, does that sound familiar at all? When Jesus came as the Messiah and was rejected, and then the people were given over to the consequences for the fact they rejected Christ. Because actions have consequences. Right? So then we get down to verse 7 and go down to the end of this paragraph in verse 14. And Zechariah is going to tell us how he carried out the Lord's instructions. He did care for the flock. 
He had two staffs. He named them favor and union. And he doesn't go into great detail about the staffs other than to say that later on he broke both of them. Right? That, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense until you understand what each one signified. He named one favor and one union. So the one called favor signified the favor God had toward his people. They were his people. He called them for a particular purpose, called them into relationship, right? He does that with us. Union, the union between the northern and southern kingdoms, Judah and Israel, they're, they're one people of God, even though for a time they were divided. And so when Zechariah breaks these two staffs, we've got to understand what's really happening. The favor of the Lord toward his people has been broken the union of God's people, Judah and Israel, has been destroyed. See, it's a lot of symbolism here. When you see what has happened and how God has dealt with His people because of their, <clears throat> because of their response, <coughs> excuse me, when, when God comes to His people and, and commands them to do things and calls them into a relationship, and then they just ignore that, Right? Let me ask you to ponder something real quick. Can you recall a time in your life God's spoken to you, called you to do something, shown you something in His Word, and prompted you in a certain direction, and you responded by either ignoring it or being disobedient? Can you recall how that felt? Can you recall the consequences in that situation? Can you recall... What happened following that response? I don't know the situations and I don't know what happened, but I can be pretty sure that it wasn't good. Because you know what's a principle from God's Word that we hear all the time and see it in Scripture all the time? Blessing follows obedience. Judgment follows disobedience. Blessing follows obedience. Judgment follows disobedience. That's true in life. That's true especially in spiritual things. But think about, uh, where, where do we see this clearly? Parent-child relationships? Blessing follows obedience. Punishment, judgment follows disobedience, right? We're taught that from an early age. So here, Zechariah is embodying a message for God's people. And, and I want to show you something very... This is really particular in this section before we move on to the last one. In, in verses 7 through 14, you get down to, toward the end of this paragraph. And there's a couple of things that we need to point out of what... Zechariah did. Zechariah destroyed three shepherds. Look at verse 8. In one month I destroyed the three shepherds, but I became impatient with them, and they also detested me. See, in the Old Testament there were three significant offices. Prophet, priest, and king. And they had certain roles that they fulfilled for the people, right? The prophet heard from God, spoke to the people. The priest interceded for the people, offering sacrifices. The king ruled over the people and protected them. Prophet, priest, and king. Very significant offices. Well, Zechariah says, I destroyed three shepherds in one month. I want you to look ahead. This was 500 years before Jesus was born. But when Jesus came and He lived... And he died, and he rose, and he ascended. And then the, the days following that, in the book of Acts, the New Testament church is started. The gospel is being spread. Then Jerusalem gets destroyed in AD 70. And you know what happens? Those three significant offices are no more. And let me tell you the interesting facts about that situation when jesus came as the messiah jesus christ fulfilled three offices 
Jesus is our prophet, priest, and king. Jesus gives us the Word of God. Jesus intercedes on our behalf. We have one mediator between God and man. It's the man, Christ Jesus. He is our king. He rules over us. He protects us. He gives us direction. He leads us. Jesus Christ is the true prophet, priest, and king. But he was rejected. You know what's interesting historically? Because some, some people don't necessarily ascribe to this as being the truth. But here's some facts that are historical. According to Jesus, John the Baptist was the last of the prophets. Now, why would he be the last of the prophets? Because the, the true prophets arrived. Also, the priesthood ceased with the destruction of the temple in AD 70. So you can't offer sacrifices if there's no temple. The job of the priest has been done. 33 AD on a hill called Calvary. The sacrifice was offered once for all. Since the fall of Jerusalem, no king has ever ruled over a Jewish state. Those aren't coincidences. We don't need an earthly human prophet, priest, or king. We've got Jesus. Jesus is all three and so much more. He's all we need. So even in the midst of this dark chapter, we start to see some light over the horizon because we see the, the symbolism, the pointing toward Jesus as the Messiah, even in the midst of judgment, destruction, punishment. The other interesting thing about this passage, this middle paragraph here, is when you get down to verse 12 and 13. There's another prophecy that points us to Jesus. Because you read verse 12, you read verse 13, and here's what you see. If it seems good to you, give me my wages. But if not, keep them. They weighed out my wages. Thirty pieces of silver. Is that ringing a bell to anybody? Now, in case it's not crystal clear, I want you to read verse 13 with me. Just, just follow along. And I want you to see in verse 13 who is speaking. Then the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter. The lordly price. The lordly price. At which I was priced by them. You, do I need to explain it? Jesus had a price set on his head. A price of betrayal. Judas was handed 30 pieces of silver. That's all Jesus was worth to him. And when he realized the gravity of what he had done, you can read it in the Gospels, he tried to give the money back, but they wouldn't accept it, so he threw it into the house of the Lord. You know what they used it for? They bought the potter's field. Just, y'all, just read the Bible. Just, just read it. It's right here. I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. And you see what happens right after that? Verse 14. Then I broke the second staff union, annulling the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. You see, nothing in God's Word is meaningless. There's, there's so much here that we should pay attention to. Matthew 27 verses 9 and 10 recounts this exact thing. They threw the 30 pieces of silver into the house of the Lord. They bought the potter's field. So why was it so critical when Zechariah was taking this post as a shepherd to point forward toward Christ coming as the Messiah 500 years later, why was it so critical for the people to follow the shepherd? Well, Jesus would tell a parable in John chapter 10 
about that very thing. And the things he says in this teaching in John 10, let me just read a little bit of it to you so we can just make sure that there's no disconnection here in God's Word. And by the way, when you see things like this in Zechariah's prophecy and then you flip over to John's Gospel and you see this continuity, that should help us understand some things about God's Word, how trustworthy and faithful it is. When we read it in its context, when we do the hard work of studying God's Word and, and not just stop, well, I don't understand that, so I'm going to put it away. No, no, no. Let, let's, let's really dig in and see what we're reading here and understand it in its context so we can get the right meaning and understand it and apply it into our lives. In John 10, verse 1, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man's a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he's brought out all his own, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow. But they will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. You know why? They hadn't read their Bible. Chuck Swindoll once said that those who have the greatest confusion about God and his will usually have the least exposure to God and his word. Y'all, God's not trying to keep secrets from us. He gives us the Holy Spirit so that we will understand. So that our minds will be enlightened. Our understandings will be opened up and we'll see what He's saying to us. The reason why we're confused sometimes is maybe we haven't spent enough time with the Lord in His Word. It's just that simple. Why don't, why don't we do that? We go through life with unanswered questions. Struggles, challenges, difficulties, some of which we don't even have to go through if we would simply get into the Word and let the Word get into us. Spend time with Jesus. What are some lessons, uh, before we get to this last paragraph, that that little passage in John 10 that I just wrote, read, those, those few verses, you know what we learn just in a couple of verses in John 10? The Lord Jesus Christ knows His sheep. The Lord Jesus Christ calls His sheep by name. And the Lord Jesus Christ leads His sheep. That's a good shepherd. Do you start to see that we, we have a really good shepherd? And, and we ignore him at our own peril. We'll, we'll fail. The more we push Jesus away, the less time we spend in the Bible, the less time we spend in the gathering of God's people, the less time we spend in godly priorities, we will suffer for those types of misplaced priorities. And it's, it's so clear. So what's our application? Jesus knows His sheep. He calls His sheep by name. He leads His sheep. Sometimes we talk about God's sovereignty, His foreknowledge, His election. Those words kind of make us nervous sometimes. And I get that. Because there's unknown. I understand. But those things are not meant to cause us difficulty. Those things are meant to cause us great peace and comfort. You, you think when we get to the New Testament, do you think the Apostle Paul was just trying to start a problem in the controversy? First of all, it wasn't His Word. It was from the Holy Spirit. He wasn't trying to cause trouble. He was trying to help us to understand. This is a, a, a beautiful and 
uh, wonderful and beneficial truth that Jesus knows my name. I shouldn't be worried about that. And, and you know, a lot of these words, sometimes we, we hear these words, we get a little nervous. You, you know what one of those words is for me sometimes is the word election. Sometimes that makes me a little uneasy, right? Because it kind of gives me the sense that I don't have a, as much control as I thought I did. But let me, want, let me tell you something I found out about election. The more I preach the gospel, the more people get elected. Isn't that interesting? If you tell people about Jesus, you might see more people getting saved. That's just, just my two cents. But, you know, sometimes when... Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and say this. See that right there? You know what's behind that curtain? You know what it's used for? There's no water in that right now. Why isn't there water in it? Maybe I'm, I'm not telling people about Jesus as much as I should. Just a guess. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm being disobedient. Maybe my priorities are out of whack. And maybe I'm not the only one. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How will they call on the one they haven't believed in? How will they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? How will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they're sent? We are sent. We're set apart. The New Testament word for church is ecclesia. The assembly, the set apart ones. We're set apart for a purpose. The purpose is to tell people about Jesus. The more we do that, the more often there's water flowing back here. Number three. Satan is a worthless shepherd. The Bible is very clear about the fate of the worthless shepherd. The Lord said to me, Take once more the equipment of a foolish shepherd. I'm raising up in the land a shepherd who does not care for those being destroyed, does not seek the young or heal the maimed or nourish the healthy, but devours the flesh. And then the final verse of our chapter today says, Woe to my worthless shepherd who deserts the flock. So, Zechariah is trying to embody this message, trying to demonstrate these principles. And so this character in the last three verses is going to reach its ultimate picture in Revelation 13 and Daniel 7 in the Antichrist. The opposite of everything Jesus wants. He deserts the flock. He doesn't care about the flock. Because his ultimate goal is to destroy the flock. No regard for the sheep. Doesn't care for those being destroyed. But the Lord's going to bring ultimate judgment on this foolish, worthless shepherd. So what's our application for the final paragraph here? These bookends of judgment that I referred to, the first three verses and the last three verses... It kind of re-emphasizes this important truth in Scripture. The author of sin and rebellion is Satan himself. So when we follow his path rather than the path of Jesus, then we subject ourselves to that same ultimate end as him, which is eternal condemnation apart from Christ. That's what's coming for our enemy. Our enemy is going to be eternally condemned. 
apart from Christ. And he won't be alone because everyone who follows him instead of Jesus will be right there with him. So just to try to make this as clear as I can make it. Every time we rebel against Christ, every time we disobey His Word, every time we think we know better than God, we are in danger of traveling farther down a path that takes us farther away from Jesus. And the ultimate consequence of that is separation. And we, we don't want that. And it's not based on our good works or, or not. It's based on the grace and mercy of Christ. And so this is why it is so um, critical that we are united with Christ. That, that's what this is all about. This dark chapter in this prophecy, it's all about pointing us to Jesus. That's, that's what we all need. We all need to be united with Jesus. So let me close today with just eight statements. And I, I didn't write these. These are from um, a pastor named Thomas Moore from years and years and years ago. Eight statements of practical application from this passage today. Number one, no defense shall protect the wicked from punishment when God's time has come. We, we have a response to give, a decision to make, and we do not have an unlimited time clock. God calls us to Himself through Christ. Today is the day of salvation. Number two, sin is always folly or foolishness. And the sinner always the fool. There's an old saying. I wish I could find out who said it first so I could give them proper credit. But I know I didn't make it up. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. Keep you longer than you want to stay. Cost you more than you want to pay. Every single time. Number three. And this is interesting for our day. Wicked rulers are a curse of God on a wicked nation. A lot I can say about that. I won't. Number four. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know why they're poor in spirit? Because they're broken over their sin. And they're drawn to Christ for forgiveness. That's why theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Number five, union of feeling in a people is a mark of the favor of God. Disunion is a token of His wrath. The greater degree of unity we experience in this gathering, in this church body, the greater unity... The closer we are to Christ, the favor of God, and the opposite is also true. Number six, Christ cannot be rejected with impunity. That means eventually there will be consequences. We can't continue to go away from Jesus and think there's no accountability. Number seven, men now sometimes reject Christ for a far less reward than 30 pieces of silver. And of course far more guilt than Judas. What, how much do we value Jesus? And you know how we know? You know how we know how much we value Him? What are we willing to trade for Jesus? Sometimes it's less than 30 pieces of silver, but the guilt's a lot more. Number eight, last one. God may bear long with the wicked, but there's a point where the piling avalanche will cease to be held back and descend in fearful ruin. I was sitting in a Bible study with senior adults on a Wednesday morning in 2012. And we were discussing the scripture we were reading that day. And one of these precious ladies just said, you know, God only has so much patience. And I, I can see her face right now. 
and the, the genuine concern on her face. God only has so much patience. But there will be a day of accountability. Folks, I'm not trying to scare people by reading Scripture. Certainly not systematically like we've done. That's not my goal. My goal is this, to understand this final truth. We desperately need a shepherd. And his name is Jesus. There, there's no other hope. There's no other place to go for shelter. There's no other place to go for forgiveness. There's no other source of grace and mercy and kindness and love. It's, it's only Jesus. And it doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done, what life you've had or not had. Because Romans 10.13 is still and will always be ultimately true. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What's stopping you? What's stopping you from calling out to Jesus today? Let's pray.